Hi, and welcome back to Stock Talk. This is Joe Rabel with Rabel Stock Research. So uh, today in the lesson to start the show, I'm going to talk about how I got into using multiple time frames and why it became so clear to me that it could have a massive advantage in my analysis. So let's go ahead and get into the agenda. So I want to talk about how I learned to do uh, trading in multiple time frames. And obviously, you want to look at price. You want to look at uh, moving averages, especially. Uh, but I want to show you why MACD made it so clear for me in, in its simplicity and getting me to understand how to use two time frames together. Um, and, you know, it's essentially just learning how to use a higher time frame and a lower time frame. So I'm going to get into that, and then I'm going to go through the stock requests that came through. So uh, let's go ahead and get into this lesson now. For the lesson, I've got Apple up, and I've got a daily chart on the right and an hourly chart on the left. And what I want to show, and make sure you do understand that when I started looking at multiple time frames, I obviously started with moving averages. And I've given credit in my book to uh, a guy named uh, Lowry. Scott Lowry wrote a book on the magic of moving averages. And it's the reason why I use an 18 and a 40, because I kind of adopted those. Now, he wrote it for commodities, but I adopted those moving averages because when I started to look at stocks, I was very surprised at how... Uh, uh, accurate they were and how they work just as he described in the book. Now, one of the things that I'll tell you is that it, I think if you're looking for a way to learn, I, I actually think it's easier to study the MACD in multiple time frames first and then start applying what you're seeing in uh, the moving averages and the price structure. And the reason is it's so simple in the way that it's designed and the way that the signals uh, come about. So if we look on the right side, I just want to start and say, OK, I know that um, when the MACD crosses above its signal line, that's essentially where it's considered to be giving a buy signal. OK, and I, I know I'm going to take this down to a really simple level here. But if we look at what happened um, on this chart back in June of this year, the MACD, actual MACD line crossed above its signal line right about that level. OK, and at that point, if you look at it this way, th this is the higher time frame all throughout up until just recently, just in the last few days, the trend has been up based on the MACD because the MACD line has been above its signal line. All right. Now, I like to see the signal line rising, but the, the reality is as long as the MACD line itself is above the signal line, you should assume that the bias is to the upside. Now, what that means is that you can only trade to the long side as this is black. The, the uh, MACD line is above the red line, the signal line. OK. And when that what that's telling me is that that's my trend or that's my bias. I know that I want to trade. I want to trade to the upside. All right now, from that point on, that's late June. That's happening right about here. I'm looking for all the times, and this is what I did when I first started out. I was saying, okay, I know that Gerald Appel in his book talks about, uh, and I read the original work of Gerald Appel. He was the creator of this MACD uh, indicator. And in his original works, he talks about a move back down just slightly below, at or below the zero line, and looking for reversals back to the upside where uh, the MACD line will cross back above, above the signal. So we have these signals taking place here, and we have another one that's right at the zero line. We get another one that's right below, right? And then we have another one that's fairly close to the zero line. And then we have a, a, an outright break of the zero line. This is different. This isn't like what we've seen through these prior four signals. But if you notice, every time this took place or this took place um, at a point where this time frame, the MACD was above its signal line. So now I have two time frames telling me the same thing. I've got an uptrend on this time and I'm getting buy signals on this time frame. So this is how I was using these two time frames together. I was basically saying, okay, I'm going to use this for the trend. This is the trend. And I'm going to play in the direction of that only. 
And then um, I'm going to use this for my entries. And I'm going to look for ones that are at or near the zero line. And it's still today is, is still a quality approach. And what you'll find is that you'll end up buying pinch plays on the higher time frame and you'll get zero line reversals on the, on the lower time frame. Still a very great way to look at the world. Uh, if you want to be a trader, it's not a bad approach. Now, I've added a lot. I've added uh, since the beginning and started using multiple time frames. I added the ADX. Um, I've I've added some certain things that are taking place with zero line overrun. And I talk about that in a lot of the videos uh, that I do, especially over on YouTube, on my YouTube channel. But the, the reality is once we have the higher time frame in a direction, it has to have a direction. It has to either be up or be down. And that's why I really like to see the signal line kind of either rising or falling. From there, I'm looking for a period where the, the MACD line respects the signal line, okay? And then from there, I can take entry signals in the direction of the trend over and over again. Now, you can do the exact same thing using an 18MA, uh, the exact same approach, and I've learned how to do that since I studied the MACD, but I started with MACD first because it's the, the signals are either, black, it's so black and white, either you're above this line or you're not, and you're either coming down near the zero line and turning up, and it's a clear, crystal clear signal. Now, the problem with doing it this way is that the signals can be late. By the time you get a crossover signal, the, the move could have made a pretty significant run if you look at where these signals are actually, the buy signals are actually taking place, sometimes they can be late. And that's why in my book, I talk about a number of different types of ways to handle that. So I just thought it was worthwhile for you guys to understand the beginning in terms of where, I, I, because I know how hard it was for me to understand multiple time frames. It took me a long time. And I've, I've dealt with a lot of smart, smart market guys, smart technical guys that took a long time to understand how to truly understand how to use multiple multiple time frames together and uh, sort of trade with confluence. I think this is a really neat way, and it's the reason why in my book I talk about the two time frame pinch play as a great way to learn how to use multiple time frames together because that's essentially what I'm showing with this uh, with this pattern here. Now, I'm, not, I'm obviously using the crossover signal as a buy signal here, but there are ways where you can complement that um, using a pinch uh, signal that follows. So anyway, hope this helps you understand. And I, what I would do is go back and look at a lot of stocks, go through with just two time frames together. You can do it on a monthly and a weekly. You can do a weekly and a daily uh, or something like this for swing trading um, and get an understanding of how the MACD signals will get you on the right side of the trade and, and really help with your timing. All right, let's go ahead and get into the analysis now. Just briefly, my services can be found at rabelstockresearch.com. I provide about two to three reports each week, plus a special video for the individual package. Uh, I cover the indices, sectors, as well as uh, individual stock ideas. If you have uh, interest in giving it a try, you can use a coupon code STOCKTALK and get the first two months for $50. Let's go ahead and get into the stocks now. As we get into the analysis now and going through the requests, I'm really excited about what's going on with the show because uh, when I originally came up with this idea, I thought that it, it would be really good if we had a situation where the viewers would kind of design each week's content. Um, I mean, I've obviously created the format of the show, but you are creating the content, especially when we look at this week and the requests that came through. I had a, a question on the 10-year treasury yield, and then I also got a question on the 20-year uh, bonds. And so we kind of have a little bit of a theme here in terms of going through the indexes this week, uh, in terms of just getting an idea of what's going on with the bond market. So that's going to be where we're going to um, go right after I go through this uh, S&P uh, analysis. And I, I want to do this at the beginning, especially because of the way the market's been acting. But also, I, I want to explain something. I spend a significant amount of time talking about indicators, especially MACD and ADX. And I obviously, when you look at the lesson, that's what a lot of it was about. But I want to make sure you realize that I'm not, I, I those are second, in some cases, second and third degree uh, derivatives of price. Price is the source for all of these indicators. So we have to go with price first. Price is going to give the first 
uh, signs of a change in trend. We're always going to see it first in price. So you have to know what you're seeing in price before you look at the I indicators. All right. Now, <clears throat> I know the lesson was describing how to use uh, MACD in multiple time frames, but I'm kind of under the assumption that you have at least a basic knowledge of how to look at price action. So I would start there if you haven't done that yet. And then when you get a, a good grasp of uh, price action and price structure, then I think you can start thinking about multiple time frames. And that's where this lesson can come in pretty handy. Um, what I want to focus in on here is I've got the zigzag and I've kind of made it a little thicker this week because I want to show you what is really taking place that's different this time. If we go back and look at 2018, we had a uh, from peak to trough, we had about of a 20% decline, but we only had an ABC decline. It, when you look at a zigzag or a swing chart or whatever you want to call it, we made a, a low and then we made a lower high and then we made a lower low. That was an ABC decline. Now, it was a ferocious one and it took out, when it was all said and done, it took out the, the previous area, um, but it still qualifies as a ABC decline. Then we had another move to the upside and then starting in 2020, um, we had a ABC decline. You can see down, rally up, come back down, all just uh, one lower high, one lower low in that whole sequence, all right? So that only qualifies as an ABC. It's not a trend reversal. For a trend reversal, we need to be going up. We need to come down, make a lower low, and then we need to make a lower high, and we have to make a second lower low. Um, yeah, and so we haven't done that in either of these situations. But if you look at what happened here during the course of this year, we took out this low and then we took out this low. Then we rallied up and made a double top. Then we came down and took out this low and took out this low. I mean, we have confirmation of a bear trend in place based on this, this sequence of events that takes place using a swing chart, just the price action, all right? I'm not looking at indicators right now, just looking at pure price action. Now, what's become interesting here recently is that we had a low that we made, we made a lower low here, but then look at this rally. You see how this rally came up and took out this prior high? Now, that doesn't put us in a bullish trend, but what it does is it's almost like a bull alert pattern. We're saying, okay, you know what? We've got the first step in place. We've, take, we've made one um, higher high now. And if you notice, the swing chart has also created a peak here. So we've, we've now created the hot, the, the, this peak now that becomes very important because if we turn up from here and take out this prior high, we have now created the two higher highs that would reverse the process that's taken place here. So how this plays out over the course of the, you know, say the next month or two is going to tell us a lot. I mean, if we keep dropping down and we end up making a lower high and another lower high, it's, it pretty much puts this whole sequence, this rally in jeopardy. But if we can come down and hold the 18 week, which is trying to cup, cup around somewhere around this 4,000 area, maybe, um, or maybe even right here and just turn up and take out this high, we're not only are we going to be making this second higher high, we're also going to be taking out the 50% retracement of the old decline. So we have to keep these things in mind because I think this would neutralize this pattern dramatically. I don't expect this to turn into a bullish trend where we just go breaking out to new highs. But if we can neutralize this pattern by coming here, we have more upside potential. And I think what it does is eliminate a lot of the downside risk. And it could turn into more of a trading, um, more of a stock picking type environment um, as opposed to having a dead bearish environment or a dead bullish environment. So just keep this in mind, but this is a really critical uh, zigzag. I love to use this. This is one of the best zigzags I've seen in all the software programs that I use. Now, I use the two in, uh, let me just show you this. Um, my settings or percentage is five and the set to auto, and then the multiplier is two. All right. I use the close, calculated from the close, um, but I can just tell you that uh, this is a really good uh, zigzag indicator. All right. Um, we spent enough time on that. Let's go ahead and start talking about the bonds now. Um, I've got my four charts back up. And the reason is I want to show what's going on when we look at uh, the monthly and the weekly in the 10-year uh, yields. All right. We've made a big move to the upside 
Look at this monster move to the upside. Now, there's a there's some bullish things going on here and some bearish things. Number one, um, this is very bearish. The momentum is really strong. We see a rising ADX line confirmed by Green DI. And look at the MACD hitting new highs uh, along with... Um, price. So those are positives. The negatives are we've come into this resistance zone up here. It's kind of a problem area. And we had a big monthly reversal bar suggesting that this this area is a, is a, a bit of a problem area. The second thing we've got is that we're extended away from the 18-month uh, line. So I think the highest probability is we form some kind of a range here and, and work off this overbought condition because we're still pretty far away from the 18-month line. I think the bias is up because the momentum signs are good. Now, if we go to the weekly, you can also see what's going on when we look at this, now we do have the resistance up here, but notice what's taken place. Um, we've made a lower low here, and we also made a lower low here. There's no divergence. There's no hidden divergence. There's no real sign of, uh, of a big slingshot coming or anything like that. I think we just have resistance here. We have the same kind of topping tail on this chart that creates some resistance up here as we get over three. But I think there's also a decent amount of support underneath. And it just increases the likelihood that we form some kind of a range and work off that we're basically digesting the big move that we made to the upside by consolidating and working off sideways. So far, the consolidation has been very healthy, in my opinion. Okay, let's look at the TLT. Now, this is obviously the opposite right? This is, this is the bonds and uh, the TNX was the yields. Uh, the TNX is for the 10-year and this is for the longer term 20-year. Now, if we look at what's taking place, we have a pretty strong trend to the downside. And I can see that because ADX is measuring a pretty strong reading. Now, there's, there is something that's developed recently and that's on this rally, MACD has come back above its signal line. Okay, now if we make a new low, if we come down here and make a minor new low or any kind of a new low, and this line, and I'm gonna zero in on this. So it could play out in one of two ways. It could just come down and break the signal line and make a higher low, and that would still be considered divergence if it played out that way. Now we're gonna need to see price turn around after going to a new low to kind of trigger that as a potential buy signal. But even more powerful would be if this came down and took out this low and this held the signal line during that process, then we'd have a divergent pinch pattern, which I think is a little bit more powerful, again, assuming that things turn back around. I mean, if this, this keeps dropping, then eventually this is going to go to a new low. So we need price, again, to trigger us in, and we're going to want to see how it pivots around this area. But right now, we're, we're in a downtrend. We've got a declining 18-week um, we are stretched away on the monthly, and we do have some support coming in a little bit lower. So I think the trend is lower, but we're on the lookout for signs of potential momentum divergence, if, especially if we hit a uh, minor new low here. So kind of be on the lookout for that at this point. Let's start moving into some of the stock requests that came in. So wire, I think, is a really powerful looking pattern. I mean, I love the way this set up. Look at this powerful move to the upside, confirmed here, confirmed here, and then we've been working it off. Now, the negative with this and the question that I got was all this volatility. Look at the size of these bars. They're huge. See, these are not big bars. But when you look at the, the size of these bars relative to the size of these bars, it's like these are like two, three, four times the size. So the question is, how do you handle that? And the way I do it is I look at what the average true range is for the stock. And then I want to know, I want to have a 20 period average true range in mind when I'm looking to get in something like this because I want to stay outside of that range by two times. So if the average range is uh, for a weekly chart is say uh, $12, then I want to be 24 points. I don't know what the, what the number is on this. I don't have that right now. But what I would tell you is find that average range, multiply it times two, and make sure if you're going to buy this, you your stop is outside that range by at least 24 points. Now, I prefer for that level to be below the key moving averages on 
on that time frame. Now you can do that in any time frame you want, um, but in this environment, I'm sort of recommending to my uh, subscribers that we we stick with the weekly simply because market could have a little bit of a drop in here. And if you're on a daily chart, you're probably going to get stopped out in that situation. But if you're on a weekly and you're giving, you have a smaller position size because you're giving it more room, um, but you could still live through it, especially in a nice looking pattern that has all these criteria. Look at the way this is turning here, low ADX here, ADX starting to kick in here. I mean... Yeah, this is a really, really good pattern. Uh, it, the, in terms of entry, I would prefer to see a little handle form or something like that. Uh, but, you know, the, the bottom line is this is pretty attractive. Okay, so uh, Baker Hughes, and I start to look at uh, Baker Hughes and Schlumberger and Halliburton and look at these oil service guys relative to, um, you know, the integrated uh, oil companies as well as the EMP companies. And I just don't, I don't get as excited about these. Now, I can't, I'm not saying that they're not going to work and that they, you couldn't make money in them. I'm just saying when I look at the strength of the patterns, I'd rather be in those other areas in energy over uh, uh, something in the oil service, uh, oil equipment stuff. Um, now, this is coming into the 18 month here. It's overall, this has a pretty good look to it. I just think this was a little ferocious. This had a little bit more strength to the downside. When I go and look at a lot of energy stocks, not all of them showed negative ADI, uh, ADX uh, crossing here. And this is showing some overrun. So I think what you're gonna have to do is watch this come up, come back down, turn like that. And then I could get a little bit more interested. And again, if you, if you have the patience, there's nothing wrong with taking a hard look at something like this. But I think I would be more inclined to be looking at something like PXD or CVX. Okay, uh, Airbnb. So, you know, when I when I looking at a market that looks like it could be trying to turn around, what I'm trying to find are stocks that I call good stocks that are basically above these key moving averages. Uh, if you look at these, have declining weekly line, and we have one. Eight, we don't have a lot of history here, but we do have a declining 18 months. So price is below the 18 month, and it's below uh, a well at least has declining weekly lines here. Um, we also have price resistance up in this zone. So I think this could rally. I mean, I, I would not be surprised to see this rallying up into this zone up here. Maybe it's like 130 or something like that. I think it's more of a trading play, though. I don't think this is ready for some kind of a V bottom and take off. I think we're going to see this spend more time. Maybe it pushes a little higher, and I think it spends more time maybe trading, trying to hold the 100 area, forming a better base uh, before we actually can make real money here. So EGY is, uh, I think, a pretty powerful looking energy stock. Um, now, it, a lot of energy had a really rough pullback. You see how harsh of a pullback this was? And you can see it on the monthly chart, too, with these big red bars coming down. But we're coming into pretty good support. And I guess what I'd be looking for is some kind of a rally up, and then we form some kind of a, um, a little sideways consolidation pattern where uh, we, wa we want to see this 18 kind of cup around and, get, uh, st and start to provide some kind of support. This looks like the 18 month is providing support. So the long term trend is still up. It's just the intermediate term trend right now is in a correction. And we need to see this exceeded. Now it could break through it and then pull back, or it could fail at it, come back down, and then break through that way. Either way, I think that's what I'd be looking for. I think there's pretty good support right here based on what the MACD is doing. So Zoom, I mean, I, I know I saw an article that uh, Kathy Woods came in diving into this thing uh, being down a huge amount. And, you know, I, don't, I have no idea of her strategy or anything like that, but uh, I did get a question about this. So I, I want to at least give you my two cents on it. So um, I'm not a huge fan of buying a stock. Now, I like buying stocks near their lows like this, right? If I want to be aggressive and I want to buy off of a low, I don't have a problem with that. But the way it gets to that low is highly relevant to me. I don't want to buy something that's gapping down, showing massive, strong momentum to the downside. If I want to buy this, I want to make this prove itself 
at this area. Maybe it even undercuts this low and then forms some kind of a higher bottom. And if we have that and I want to be aggressive, then maybe I'm willing to do that. Um, I personally would wait for this to get back above its 18 week now. Um, it's back below that line. It was trying to hold it. And a lot of these stocks that have been beaten up have had a real hard time turning things around. And I, I personally think that this is going to be the time based on what I described in the uh, uh, the zigzag or the swing chart on the S&P, I think a lot of these stocks have so much damage, the trend is so bearish, that it's going to be more of a cupping pattern or a basing pattern that really makes it work um, before it gets going again, as opposed to seeing some kind of a quick turn. Okay, let's look at BG real quick. Um, so, I mean, we're getting a pretty good rally here. It's rallying into the 18 week, but what we're gonna need to see is we're gonna need to see this move up and come back down and hold the 18 week line before we can get interested in this stock. There's too much resistance based on this harsh move to the downside and uh, on the monthly chart, I think there's some resistance up here above, two, uh, above 100. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.